The next uh, two talks form part of an industry-sponsored session on GLP-1 agonists. Um, and we're going to start off with Professor Lars Ryden. Um, now, Professor Ryden's spoken at this meeting before. Um, many of you will know him, and certainly by reputation. He's a professor of cardiology at the Karolinska. Um, and I'm tempted to say that although he's a cardiologist, he brings an exceptionally broad view to this field. Um, and um, as you can tell from the title, um, which is one I think only a small proportion of cardiologists will be able to handle. Um, he's going to talk about um, the pleiotropic effects of GLP-1 agonists uh, and their potential clinical importance. Lars. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, but not for the title. <laughs> it is a tricky title, and I struggled a lot, in particular since I am followed by a world authority on this field, and I have decided to put a clinical cardiovascular perspective on this, and then you will hear the theoretical magnificent talk after mine. These are my conflicts of interest. Let's start here. What is pleiotropy? So I went to Google, which is a very authoritative source of information, and it said it includes all of a drug's actions other than those which it was intended for additional beneficial effects. It may include side effects. So fine, good to know. And what were the GLP-1 receptor agonists actually developed for? Well, they were developed for lowering glucose. They are actually not only lowering glucose, but um, one of their advantages is, uh, it is stated in this very informative medical source of information that they have a lower risk of causing hypoglycemia. So this must also be something that we keep in our minds when we continue this uh, review. Now, what about this glycemia? It's impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, and I think that we should rather talk about this glycemia rather than dichotomizing a continuously increasing risk factor. And it contains a lot of things that are unhealthy in various ways, as you can see here. And uh, just look at this and remember it, in particular since uh, we are going to look at what GLP-1 receptor agonists can achieve also. And what do we want to protect people from? We want to protect them from the injury that was caused when the first glucose-lowering agent was introduced into medical business. Insulin. Before that, before 1921, nobody cared for vascular problems because people died before they developed. So the invention of a glucose-lowering drug caused us to get the patients into trouble, and we have now to get away with that. This can easily be done by a multifactorial treatment. A multifactorial disease needs a multifactorial treatment. And you know as well as me that this is something that is considered being uh, of a little bit of everything here and based on lifestyle. So that is known to you all. And uh, just to show to you how efficient that can be, this is a recent example from the Swedish Diabetes Registry presenting to you now hundreds of thousands of people with type 2 diabetes and a controlled population which don't have diabetes, which is a matter of million. And if we look a little bit closer to this, you can see up here that the controlled population, the risk is put at one. And if you do have all five risk factors, which they are talking about here, smoking, hypertension, lipids, etc., and so forth, under control, your enhanced risk of having diabetes is very small. But as soon as you don't have the risk factors under control, it gets much worse, in particular if you are a relatively young person, as you can see here. And this holds true for mortality, for myocardial infarction, and for stroke. So in principle, it's extremely rewarding to be very careful with a multiple risk factor control. And that brings us to this wonderful drug. It does everything. Look here. Can you see any organ which is not influenced? Multifactorial disease, multifactorial treatment, I could stop here, could I? Perhaps not, because we don't know what actually is important of all this. But this is a drug which has a multiple 
a multitude of opportunities. And do we know anything about which of these opportunities or all, if they are important? Well, to know what they do, we can go to this, uh, this um, uh, meta-analysis of some of the trials uh, which have done. And as you can see here, you have a reduction of mace, which is a combination of many evil things. And uh, all of them, besides this one, actually has a, a beneficial importance here. And since then, even this albiglutide presented data. And you can see, and I want you to uh, remember this, myocardial infarction is better protected from by this particular GLP-1 receptor agonist than any other. And that should be kept in mind. And what actually do they do? If we want to guess what they do, we can look at this example from semaglutide, and you can see here that it's impact myocardial infarction, stroke, and revascularization. So if anything, it seems that a GLP-1 agonist can influence the progression of atherosclerosis or perhaps stabilize plaques. And that could actually explain why, for instance, revascularization, stroke, and myocardial infarction are protected from uh, and not mortality. If you want to read further after my lecture, this is a very good overview. So let's look at what they say. And there are a number of things which are potential uh, important things here. And I will talk about the green ones and leave the blue ones outside. But let us start with a multiple thing here. This is a study where liraglutide improved metabolic parameters. The material was relatively small, as you can see here. It was people with diabetes with a metabolic syndrome and no major cardiovascular events. They were observed a year and a half, and uh, they got this drug added to metformin, and they looked at metabolic variables. And look here, waist circumference went down, body mass index went down, glycemia went down, HB1C as a matter of glycemia, you, you, uh, triglyceride, total cholesterol, LD cholesterol, HDL up, good and carotid intima thickness as a measure of something good uh, actually also uh, lowered. So this seemed to be something that many, many things were influenced by the GLP-1 receptor agonist, a sort of a multifactorial treatment of a multifactorial disease. And at the same time, we know that if you have a metabolic syndrome, which means you have many other risk factors, then you are at higher stake than if you don't, and the number of patients with the metabolic syndrome decreased like that. So obviously, it has actually multifactorial uh, aspects on it, GLP-1 receptor agonism. Now, let's also look at glucose for a while. Glucose uh, is an old thing. This is from the UKPS study, where, which was a study which initiated all belief in glucose lowering as the remedy for people with diabetes. But these people didn't have any lipid-lowering drugs, no aspirin, very little bl blood pressure-lowering drugs of, of, of modern type, and there was a relatively minor impact. So this was many years ago, and that was the fundament for all those glucose-lowering trials, which has been done year after year after year without showing much. So what about the GLP-1 receptor agonist? Well, if you look at the uh, difference, 0.4% in HbA1c, 0.7, 0.5, 0.5, very neglectable actually compared to what many other studies have achieved with glucose-lowering drugs of high potency. And if you look at this a little bit, bit this one, Elixa, which doesn't really impact mortality or morbidity much, had about the same glycemic um, uh, HbA1c as all the others, and also diminished a little bit without. So I don't think that glycemia is the point here. We know that we can actually achieve an absolute and relative reduction of the maze by means of relatively high HbA1Cs and not much of a lowering compared to what you can accomplish by other means. So I don't think so. And if you go to this study, which is a meta-analysis of many, many studies done looking at microvascular injury, you can see here that dialysis, 
death, blindness, neuropathy, actually not much of an impact of tight glycemic control compared to less tight. And if you go with the same for macrovascular disease, not much to be seen. So I don't think that it's the glycemia. If you just keep the glycemia at a reasonable level, you don't achieve much more by getting it very low. Another aspect is, of course, this one, which is an example from the leader study, where you can see that the episodes of hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia actually is lower. And we know in cardiovascular medicine that severe hypoglycemia in a vulnerable patient easily can induce arrhythmia and mortality. So perhaps it is to rescue them from it by protecting them from having severe hypoglycemia. What about body weight? Well, this man was the one who coined the term diabetes, thereby suggesting that there is a tight connection between obesity and diabetes, as you just heard by the splendid talk before mine. And um, there are many ways you can go from obesity to cardiovascular disease via different types of, of connections. Now, the body weight reduction here in the liraglutide study is 2.3, 4.3, 1.3, and 0.8 kilogram. So it is actually a weight reduction, which is difficult to accomplish. But if you look at, for instance, this meta-analysis of weight reduction, you can see that risk factors like blood pressure and cholesterol is beneficially impacted by weight reduction. But the conclusion of this meta-analysis was that it reduces cardiovascular risk factors. It lasts for a couple of years, but we need trials to determine the long-term impact on this, on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. We don't actually know. So if this weight loss is important for the general outcome of a GLP-1 receptor agonist or not, is not known. And we have other studies with similar weight losses which haven't been proven efficient. Then someone say, it must be cholesterol. It must be cholesterol. We know all that cholesterol is bad. And here's an example from the uh, combination of acetamide and the statins. It's from, 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 from the Improve It trial. And here you can see that there is a linear decrease in cardiovascular problems by reduction of LDL cholesterol. And even a little minute decrease here is very beneficial. So what about the impact of GLP-1 receptor? Small increase in HDL, small decrease in these ones. Small, small, and not measured in this study. So perhaps not. Or perhaps, well, there is another aspect of this. In this study, pa patients, very few as you can see, were studied with impaired glucose tolerance or newly onset type 2 diabetes. In a double-blind crossover study, where they got injections of exenatide, and then prior to a high-calorie fat-enriched breakfast meal, and studied were triglycerides, ApoB48, and so on. And here you can see the impact of postprandial release of hours after meal here. And here you have the release of triglyceride, cholesterol, and so on. And then you can see that the GLP-1 receptor agonist protects from an increase immediately after a meal. That could also be something which perhaps is more important than the small reduction, long-term reduction, in the big clinical trials. But we don't know. It's just an observation of interest. But this was independent of weight loss, glucose control, and insulin resistance. So it was a factor in itself. Systolic blood pressure. Everybody knows that high is good, bad, and low is better. So let's take a look. 1.2 millimeter, 2.6, 1.6.7. Hopsan. This study, which had the highest, largest impact on myocardial infarction, had the lowest reduction of blood pressure. That doesn't really fit into blood pressure being very important. But if we take a study, a huge study from Australia, about 11,000 people with type 2 diabetes, which were started on added blood pressure lowering treatment, although they had a relatively well-controlled blood pressure already in the beginning and were followed for a reasonable number of years. You can see here that a modest reduction of blood pressure 
actually caused a mortality reduction. And if you look at the observation time in sustained six and leader trial, they are here. So a few millimeter mercury of reduction blood pressure here should have had the time to impact morbidity and mortality. Although it doesn't prove that it is, but it's a possibility. Endothelial function. Much talked about, very important, but less well studied. But here is a Swedish study where 22 patients were subjected to, some of them healthy controls, some of them type 2 diabetes with coronary artery disease, in a randomized crossover study where they looked at flow-mediated dilatation of the brachial artery. And as you can see, people with diabetes here have a less efficient flow-mediated vasodilatation than the healthy controls. But look here, after the initiation of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, it was improved. And that could be of importance, for instance, in the coronary flow, which is related to the brachial artery flow-mediated vasodilation. But few patients and an acute observation. And finally, I would like to uh, address this, which is um, reperfusion injury, the, uh, expressed as uh, a salvage index, which is the relation between final infarct size in relation to area at risk. And this is done on 172 Danish patients who were randomly and prospectively studied on intravenous exenatide before and during PCI. And here you can see that the patients in the red line here who got it, they got the, their area at risk is here, and the higher it is, the more decreased the final infarct size. So it's impacted the final infarct size. It rescued myocardium from reperfusion injury, but again, an acute observation in relatively few patients. So with this, I would like to conclude, ladies and gentlemen. Pleiotropism, without doubt, of importance. Is it retardation of atherosclerosis or plaque stabilization we are looking after? I don't know. But probably this is important for, uh, for, for the GLP-1 receptor agonists. But none of the discussed effects is sufficient by their own strength to explain the impact. Large trials can only indicate mechanisms. You can never get any details. For instance, inflammatory response in, in the form of CRP is not reported in the large clinical trials. And it's almost hopeless to get information. Do these drugs reduce inflammation? And uh, that could be something of importance. Mechanistic studies are needed, and what is the human relevance of experimental findings that we'll hear more about in a short while? Several human studies have been performed. They are interesting, they are intriguing, they are small, they are not conclusive. And still, GLP-1 receptor agonists is a great contribution to clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you.